I'm really honored at your presence this evening for this program and just overwhelmed that we have sold almost 500 copies of the Case for Jesus book. This indicates a great interest in, in learning more about our faith, and that's a good thing. We Catholics need to learn about our faith so that we can express it in evangelizing and so that we can defend our faith when it's challenged. So I'm very, very grateful that you're, that you're here tonight. I was warned that, that the crowds would not be as strong as they were during Lent because during Lent, they go to hear someone four times as a penance. <laughs> so, if, if, if that is the case, you've really been doing some sinning. So. Let's begin this evening in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this opportunity to gather in your name. We thank you for the blessing of sacred scripture. We thank you for the blessing of revelation, that beautiful way in which you share with us your identity, your love, that beautiful way in which you help us to know our calling in life, how we are called to build up your kingdom. Bless us in our study of the case for Jesus. Bless us as we delve more deeply into your holy word and into the teachings of our church. Inspire us, guide us, and always give us the courage we need to proclaim our faith in a skeptical world. And let's pray together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So just a, a general introduction to what we're trying to do. I think I mentioned this in the homily a number of weeks ago that some years ago, the city of Chicago decided to do a program called One City, One Book. And they marshaled all the different agencies in Chicago to promote the reading of the book To Kill a Mockingbird. And they were able to arrange with the publisher a special edition that was not as expensive. They were able to arrange for a Spanish translation to be available to people. They made arrangements for discussions at the public library. And there was a study guide for students. And there were screenings of the movie To Kill a Mockingbird. And what happened as a result of that is that people in Chicago found themselves talking to one another. Whether they might have been on the L or on an elevator, they found themselves discussing aspects of a book that really does give insight into the human condition and the issues uh, affecting society, especially racism. And it, it gave an opportunity for a broad and learned discussion and our hope is that through a program like this, we can have several parishes with one book. And as I mentioned before, we have been able to go through almost 500 copies of the book. We do have some additional copies on hand tonight. And if you'd like to get one, you, you're welcome to do so at the end of the program by the door. Claire will help you with that. My hope is that we can look at this topic, this important topic, in several different ways. Some will just read the book, and that's great. Some will just come to these sessions offered on Sunday nights here and Monday night at St. Mary's in Aurora, the same program each night for four weeks. Some will go online to formed, Dot org, and they will be able to listen to the author go through the book chapter by chapter. 
Some will pick up the audio book. Someone told me before that they listened to the audio book all the way back from Philadelphia. I'm not sure that I would recommend that for long stretches of interstate highway, but, it would, it, but very much appreciate your effort to learn more in that way. Or we can combine, we can do multiple different things so that we can have a discussion as Catholics in our county so that we can make sure that we are staying up to date on important issues of our faith, especially the case for Jesus. And so you know how we're going to approach this is tonight I'll be covering roughly chapters 1 through 4. And next week, chapters 5 through 7. The following week, chapters 8 through 10. And then the final chapters in part 4. So if you want to stay up on the reading you're welcome to do that. I hope that my presentations will help to unpack uh, some of what Dr. Petrie presents, and I hope that this will prompt you to want to learn more, especially if you would like to hear the author himself, who is a very talented writer and a very talented speaker as well. He's a seminary professor. He has a doctorate in theology from uh, the University of Notre Dame. He has studied extensively the original languages of the scriptures. So he's gone and done advanced studies in Greek and in Hebrew so that he can get the real meaning of each of the words in the Bible. I'm going to recommend that you become familiar with formed.org. Uh, some call this Catholic Netflix because if you subscribe to Netflix you know that there's a variety of programs all sorts of different programs and it's the same way with formed.org which is something that you can access through your smartphone or through your tablet or even through a smart TV or if you have a device like Roku or Xbox or of uh, Amazon uh, Fire, Fire Stick, you can pull these programs up. Uh, there is a subscription fee for form.org that has been paid for by our parishes. So if you are a Catholic living in Dearborn or Ohio County, or if you are a friend of a Catholic living in, in Dearborn or Ohio County, which you all are, you can sign up on formed.org and you'll see that there's a drop down menu for you to locate your parish. And you want to look for Dearborn County Catholic. Dearborn County Catholics, then you can sign up using your email address and you can have access to the full range of programs, including Dr. Petrie's presentation on the case for Jesus. He goes through one chapter at a time. And if you are part of a study group, if you have a Bible study or a group that you like to meet with to discuss these things, there are also some study guides that can be of help to you. My hope is that we can do these kinds of programs that will get us learning in different ways because we do learn in different ways. Some of us learn from listening, some from reading, some from discussion. Uh, it, it, we're, we're, we're each one of us is different. We have a different way of learning and hopefully we can learn about this th in this way. And as I mentioned with form.org, you can access it, 4,000 titles. Uh, so Apple TV, Android, iOS, I don't know what some of these things are, but if you have a device like that or if you have a smart TV, you'll be able to watch it and listen on, on a big screen. So let's get into the reason why we are here, why we are choosing to study the case for Jesus. When we think about the word case, we think of a legal matter, don't we? That there's a case pending in court. And the case that is pending in the court of popular opinion has to do with skepticism. 
In fact, the art on the front of the book is St. Thomas, the doubter, the one who did not believe until he could put his fingers into the nail marks and his hand into our Lord's side. But having experienced the risen Lord personally, he fell to his knees and he said that prayer that many of us pray at the consecration at Mass, my Lord and my God. He proclaimed the divinity of Christ and his lordship over his own life. So skeptics can change. We live in a world of skepticism. In fact, the term relativism is a term that describes the waters in which many of our young people are swimming. A relativist says that there's no such thing as absolute truth. Relativism comes into play especially in moral issues. When you ask someone the question, is this right or is this wrong? If you get the answer, it all depends. You know that you're talking to a relativist. Relativism is rampant on college campuses. There's no such thing as absolute truth, the relativists say. I have my truth and you have your truth. Have you heard people say that? I'm used to hearing that I have my opinion and you have your opinion. I'm used to we all have a right to our own opinions, but we don't have a right to the facts. Relativism says that there is no such thing as absolute truth. Now, what's interesting is that that is an absolute statement. There is no such thing as absolute truth. We are expected to believe as an absolute truth. We have skepticism. People wonder what is real. And they wonder that for a number of reasons. You can turn on the TV and watch documentaries that question all sorts of things. And again, some of these questions are legitimate. Some can be written off as conspiracy theory, but some of them are legitimate. We don't really believe that our government is telling us everything, do we? <laughs> we don't really believe that the media is telling us everything. Skepticism from the sinking of the Titanic, not that a boat didn't go down, but the theory is that it wasn't the Titanic, it was its sister ship, to Pearl Harbor, whether it was a surprise or not, the UFOs at Roswell, or were they weather balloons, the JFK assassination, the moon landing, Paul is dead, <laughs> and Elvis lives. 9-11. COVID. Election results. And if you have the stomach for it, a whole series on ancient aliens. People are skeptical. And so why wouldn't they be skeptical about the teachings of the Bible? Why wouldn't they be skeptical about whether Jesus is real or not? They go to college and many are taught within the first week that that's all a myth. It's all a fairy tale. It's all make-believe. It's just like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. 
It's all fiction. If you want to believe it, that's fine. That's your truth. But I have my truth. Skepticism. Sometimes it comes down to what counts as proof. Because we have, for a long time, had trick photography, haven't we? Trick photography goes back decades, where you can see a picture of something that never happened. A picture with people in it who have been superimposed or who have been excluded by trick photography. Now we have Photoshop. You'll see pictures sometimes and you'll scratch your head saying, is that real? Or that's just Photoshop. Now we have video manipulation, which means that you can have a picture of a famous person moving his or her lips and saying something that that person never ever said. Now, where does the technology come from? The technology comes from a, from a, from a good thing. It is possible for someone who has lost the ability to speak, such as someone with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, they can go back and if, if that person has spoken publicly, if there are recordings of that person speaking, they can go back and put those recordings through a computer and come up with a way for that person to type and you will hear their voice saying exactly what they have typed in. Well, with that technology, there's nothing to keep us from taking a famous person who has spoken, spoken hours and hours and hours, and we can get that person to say something that he or she never said. Skepticism. Skepticism has us asking, is there any truth at all? And many young people regard Jesus today as a fable, as a myth, as a deception for the sake of profit and power. That those who fabricated the story of Jesus did so for personal gain or to gain control over the lives of other people. This is what's being taught. This is what young people are picking up. The purpose of the book, The Case for Jesus, is to acquit our Lord of these charges and to show in a learned way that indeed we have reliable sources. They are called the four Gospels. We have eyewitness testimony. We have proof of our Lord's existence and that our Lord meant every word that he said and he is absolutely reliable. The case for Jesus presents biblical and historical evidence for not only the existence of Jesus, but also as proof that he was indeed who he claimed to be. Our class is in four parts. Tonight, it, we talk about divine Revelation. Next time we will talk about the dating of the Gospels. Because, and I'll get into this more next week, when I was a, a high school student, I was taught that the Gospels, the four Gospels, were not written until long, long after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. It was a long, long time afterward. And therefore, the Gospels are unreliable. We'll talk next time about the dating of the Gospels. And we'll talk about Josephus as well, a very interesting figure from Roman and Jewish history contemporaneously, contemporaneously with the Apostles. We'll also talk in the third session on what it meant for Jesus to claim that he was the Messiah.
and for the apostles to claim him as Messiah. And then in the last, we'll talk about the death and resurrection of the Lord and how we learn so much through evidence of his death and his glorious resurrection. Tonight, divine revelation. We believe that we can know from human reason that there is a God. St. Thomas Aquinas speaks about the proofs for God's existence. He doesn't spend a lot of time talking about this because he takes for granted that everybody believe that God exists. But St. Thomas Aquinas uses as one of his proofs the first cause that everything had to have a cause. We are here because of our parents, our parents were here because of their grandparents, and so on and so on and so on. But we can't just keep going back and back and back and say that we, we can go back into infinity. There had to be a first cause. There had to be something to get the whole process moving. And this, St. Thomas Aquinas says, we can call God. God is the first cause, the one who gets everything moving. From our reason, we can know that there is a God. This is a teaching of our church. Just by using our minds, we can figure out that there is a God. But what is that God like? Is that God vindictive? Mean? Cruel? Is that God a pushover? Does God love us? Does God care for us? We can't figure that out by just reasoning. God had to reveal himself. We speak of divine revelation. He had to reveal himself just as we reveal ourselves to new people we meet. We do that gradually. We don't meet someone on the elevator and start telling our dark secrets and our life story. That person would run as fast as he or she could possibly run. But rather, when we get to be a fr friend with someone, we start sharing more and more, like the layers of an onion. More and more comes to be known by the other. God in his love and his goodness reveals himself to us. He speaks to the people of Israel. And the people of Israel had no doubt that God had revealed himself to them. The author of the letter to the Hebrews says that in ancient times, God revealed himself to his people through the prophets. But in these last days, he has revealed himself through his son. He has deigned to help us to know him by giving us his only begotten son who teaches, who works miracles, and who embodies personally everything about his message, giving his very life on the cross that we might have life and have it to the full. God reveals himself to his people. The people of Israel had the absolute conviction that God was speaking to them through the giving of the law and through the promise of the Messiah. The people of Israel would say that God has not favored other people with his wisdom and with his law and his purpose. God in his goodness has shown himself to us. And this will be brought to fulfillment when the Messiah comes. When the Messiah comes, this will be the fullness of God's sharing himself with his people. What do you suppose the literacy rate was in the ancient world. The number of people who could read or write or both. What do you suppose that literacy rate was? Guesses? Less than 1%. Less than 1%? 
we think that that's pretty close, that that's pretty close. <clears throat> about 2% maybe of the people who lived at any one time could, could read and write. Now, when you take out of that children who would have no business reading or writing at, until a certain age, um, and, and in the ancient world, you had, to take out, you had to take out women because women generally did not go to school to learn to read and write. So we think that probably about about 20% of people in the Jewish world were literate. Other societies, that number was way down. But people in the ancient world were smart. God didn't limit intelligence. People were smart. People figured out how to do things. They talked with one another. They told family stories. They told the histories of their people. How did they do this without reading and writing? They did this through oral tradition. Oral tradition. I don't know if it's true or not, but they say that when, one, when a person loses one of his or her senses, that the other senses compensate. All I know is that as a kid, it was always a blind man who came out to tune the piano. But when we don't use one faculty, we compensate with another and we get extraordinarily strong with that other faculty. When people do not have the ability to write and to read, when people have never gone to school, they've never had the advantage of, like we had little books that go through the ABCs and the numbers and the shapes and all those things, they compensate with an incredible ability to remember what has been told to them and to speak in a way that is memorable. In other words, those who are not literate develop an ability to listen and to repeat with great accuracy. And they also learn to communicate with others in such a way that people will remember. Oral tradition. Our modern world says that oral tradition corrupts. Oral tradition corrupts. This is what our modern world says. Which means that if God said things to his people, and if the fullness of God's self-communication is the giving of Jesus, and Jesus said things to people, and they weren't writing his words down, surely his words would become jumbled over the course of time. Surely his words would be misconstrued. And by the time the Gospels were written, they were written from a memory of oral tradition that had been corrupted. Do you see what I'm saying? That's not my point of view. <laughs> that's not the point of view of Dr. Petrie. That's not the view of the church. But that's the view of our modern world. If it took over two decades between the time our Lord rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, and the writing of the first gospel, if it took over two decades for that to happen, surely everything would have been jumbled up. Surely they would not have gotten it right. And because they didn't get it right, what difference does it matter? Do we want to base our lives on something that was written from a corrupted tradition. 
this is the view of the modern world. This is why many say that, well, even if Jesus did live and if, even if he was a good person, we really don't have anything that is an accurate representation of what he said, and so we really can't base our lives on Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. Do you see where I am with this? Have you met some people like this? Have you had your kids come back from college saying things like this? Because they pick it up very, very early. I was a pastor in Bloomington for six years. I got to know Indiana University very well. There are some good people at Indiana University. There are some good professors. Nonetheless, Indiana University sets students up to be extremely skeptical about revealed religion. Don't let anybody else tell you how to live your life. Oral tradition corrupts. This is the message that the modern world wants to say. This is what the modern world teaches. However, something very interesting happened in the early months of 1977. Who remembers the showing of roots? First of all, we only had three channels back then. <laughs> and when something big was happening on one of those channels, everybody watched it and everybody talked about it at work. And it happened that Roots was shown during a time of really, really bad weather all across the, most of the United States. There were bl the blizzard of 77 took place that year and that was just one part of a horrible winter. People had nothing else to do but to watch TV. And for six or seven nights in a row, Roots was presented. The story of a family written by Alex Haley and Alex Haley was a writer, and he had African-American, and he had heard his elderly aunts talking about certain events in the family history, certain events related to the first member of the family coming over from Africa in chains certain events related to what that relative was doing on the day he was captured by the slave traders. Certain things like he was out getting the materials to make his brother a drum when he was captured by the slave traders. And there were some place names that they had. His elderly aunts told this story over and over and over again. And Alex Haley was very curious to know if this was fantasy, if this was something that they had just kind of made up, or if there was any truth to it at all. And Alex Haley was able to go back through records, public records, of his own parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. He was actually able to locate the plantation that had been home to some of his ancestors. And plantation owners in the South kept very meticulous records. It's possible to go and find bound volumes that list names and, and dates. And he was able to trace things back to a certain point. He was still curious about the place names that were mentioned. 
He asked a linguist who was familiar with African languages, and the linguist was very quickly able to say, your aunts were talking about Gambia. Gambia. And he got a contract for his book, Roots, that was turned into the miniseries. He got the money that he needed to go to Gambia, to go back to a particular village that was also identified by the place names. He wanted to learn as much as possible, and he found out that the history of families was kept alive for hundreds of years by an individual in the community known as a griot a griot. The griot's job was to memorize genealogies, to memorize the names of who belonged to who. And so Alex Haley said, um, have the griot uh, go back to about 1730 and have him uh, tell me about this family. And they told Alex Haley, that's not the way it works. The griot is not a dictionary that we can simply look up and have him go back to a certain point in time. But what we can do, because the griot of this clan is, is nearby, we can go and we can listen to him tell the story. The griot started telling the story of the family. It took four hours, hundreds of years of history related before Alex Haley heard a familiar phrase. He heard the griot say that Kunta Kinte went out into the forest to get materials to make his brother a drum. And it was when he was doing this that he was captured and never heard from again. After four hours, <laughs> Alex Haley wakes up and says, have, have him repeat it, have him repeat it. He turns the, turns the tape recorder on and he repeats. He repeated from memory what Alex Haley's elderly aunts had heard. He was able to make a connection. And before he left Gambia to go back to the United States to write his book, a man came running after him wildly, saying, I am a kinte. I am a kinte. I am your blood. I am related to you. My purpose in putting this up is to show that oral tradition does not necessarily corrupt when it is deliberately remembered by those who have the capacity to do so. Not every member of the tribe could be a griot, just like each of us have different talents. Some can do wonders with a block of wood. Some can do wonders with a, with a brush and a canvas. Some of us have an affinity to remember things. The griot was able to remember and the memories were verified by historical record. And it all came together so that Alex Haley could present his story of an American family. Proof that oral tradition does not necessarily corrupt. Proof that the telling of a story of what Jesus said or did over the course of 20 years 
might not necessarily corrupt. Now, we still believe that oral tradition corrupts, don't we? We still believe it because we live in a world where to buy 500 sheets of paper and a pen that does not run out <laughs> and the ability to sit down at a computer and type and type and type and type. We even have computers we can talk to and they'll do the typing for us. We can fill page after page after page after page. In fact, we get a newspaper in the morning that's dozens of pages and by the end of the day it's in the rubbish pile and we'll get another another one. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of words come out come at us in writing. Because writing is how you preserve something accurately. Oral tradition is suspect because of a little game that we have played. Do you know the telephone game? How does the telephone game work? How does the telephone game work? What, what, what starts the telephone game? You say the first word and then talk to the next person and then they tell the third person and then they tell the fourth. So, so, so I, might, I might have a phrase and I would tell one person, I'd whisper it to that person and then they go to the next person and they would whisper that phrase to another and another and another. And by the time we get down to about 10 people, we ask that 10th person, okay, what's the phrase? And when that person gives the phrase, the original speaker laughs because it is so far off the mark. It is so far off the mark. Or the passing on of a message orally has been corrupted. Therefore, oral tradition corrupts. Right? Not necessarily. What are the, what are the dynamics of the telephone game? First of all, that phrase that starts it all out, that's usually a very, a, a very important, uh, a very heavy phrase that no one would ever want to forget, correct? <laughs> like the penguins got on the boat and went to Atlantic City and walked on the boardwalk. That's an example of a phrase that starts the telephone game. It's not very significant, is it? And it's whispered. Whispers are not our best form of communication. If you want to get a message across, you don't whisper. You articulate. And a message that is given orally once, well, Advertisers know that if you want to get a message communicated, you have to communicate over and over and over again. For a while, the Coca-Cola company had as it, the advertising branch of Coca-Cola had as, as its, its mission to put the word Coca-Cola in front of every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth ten times a day. That's how Coca-Cola got to be the brand that it is. What is the message that is communicated in oral tradition of the scriptures? The oral tradition behind the scriptures. It is a significant message. It's not a throwaway phrase. It is a significant message. It is a message that has been repeated over and over and over again. Ever hear of a stump speech? When someone is running for office, sometimes the platform they use is a stump. It gets them up a couple, couple feet higher than everybody else. 
when someone runs for office and we listen to that person often enough, I, you have to be a glutton for punishment to do this. But one year I was watching the, the presidential election closely and C-SPAN had at the end of every day, it had the speeches that were given by the, the two uh, two candidates uh, opposed to one another for, for president. And you heard them give their talks from that day. And the amazing thing is that if you watched C-SPAN and you watched that presentation of the presidential candidates for a week, you would discover that those politicians were saying pretty much the same thing over and over and over again. Each message was tailored to the place, but when one politician got going on domestic policy, you heard the same phrases over and over again. The stump speech or foreign policy, you would hear the same phrases over and over and over again. Part of my life for seven years was going around the country giving talks on stewardship as a way of life. I managed to fly over a million miles in seven years, which makes me a million miler with Delta. <laughs> I am always on the upgrade list. <laughs> and I tell people that's a much more practical honor than being named Monsignor. <laughs> As I gave my, my parish missions especially, I was asked to do four talks at each parish that I would go to four nights. And I had some notes in front of me uh, to use, but after a little while, those notes were just crutches in case I really had brain fog. And pretty soon, I didn't even bring the notes with me four nights in a row, 45 minute talk each night from memory. If, you're, if, if you really want me to do that tonight, I can. <laughs> <laughs> that material was so familiar to me that it, it was, it wasn't like I was, you know, I, I was reciting word for word, but it came out the same every time I did it. Some of the phrases that I used in those talks find their way into homilies that I give to you. And over the course of the years, you'll figure out what my favorite phrases are, because you'll hear them. You'll hear them over and over again. What kind of presenter was our Lord? Ordinary, blasé, plain. He was gifted, wasn't he? He was a gifted presenter. First of all, he had an incredibly important message to deliver. And even though we only have four Gospels, and we only have our Lord repeating certain parables, we can bet that our Lord was telling those parables at every town that he visited. That as he made his way through, traveling perhaps 30 miles a day, that was kind of the, that was a day's journey, about 30 miles. He would stop and he would talk for hours, telling the parables, sharing his wisdom, in a most beautiful way, in a culture where people were used to remembering things, and in a culture in which speakers learned to recite in a certain way, to speak in a certain way that was memorable. Repeating that day after day, not to sell a product, not to get votes, but to save souls. This was his mission. Out of his goodness, he was reaching out and speaking. 
And he was doing so in such a way that he attracted so many people. At one point, along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he had to get into a boat and go out 20 or 30 feet as people gathered around the shore. And he spoke. On another occasion, the multitudes came out and he spoke all day to them. So, so long that the apostles were saying, these people are going to die of starvation by the time you finish. We need to send them away to the nearby villages to get food to eat. And of course, that was the occasion when Jesus said famously, give them some food yourselves. And they said, we don't have anything else other than five loaves and two fish. What good is that? Well, we know the rest of the story, don't we? Our Lord was speaking to people who were used to listening. He was speaking in a way that had a certain rhythm, a certain way in which people would naturally understand. By the way, do you remember the example that I gave about the telephone game? Tell me. T tell, tell me what the example, it had to do with penguins, right? You're, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we got it, we got it. You, you, you might get a C plus on an, on an exam with that. But let's try this one. Listen, my children, and you shall hear. How did you know that? How many decades has it been since you learned that verse from, from Longfellow? pushing five or six decades, and you still got it down. Why? It's poetry, isn't it? It's poetry. It has a certain rhythm to it. You can hear Paul Revere's horse galloping along as, as you read Longfellow. And many people can go deep into that poem because they learned it as a kid. It was written in such a way that it was meant to be remembered. Oral tradition did not corrupt, did it? You remembered because it was presented so well. Our Lord presented for three years, the scriptures say. Three years, every day in a different place, every day telling the same the same parables and the same sayings. Not that he would do every single one every single day, but over the course of a, of, of a week, a month, who was listening? The apostles were listening. The apostles were listening. And they had the opportunity to have dinner with our Lord and lunch with our Lord and breakfast with our Lord. And they had the chance to ask the questions. What did you mean by that? What, 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 tell, help me to understand this better. They had the opportunity to engage the Lord. And over the course of three years, they had heard every parable. They had heard every message. They were used to remembering. He was used to speaking in a memorable way. And so when our Lord sent the apostles out saying, go therefore teach all the nations. Teach them what I have taught you. What do you suppose they did? What was their message like? Was their message, well, it had something to do with penguins and a boardwalk and Atlanta. He's kind of said something. I, you know, we kind of got that. No. They loved him dearly. Each one of them was affected personally in a powerful way. 
They watched him work miracles. They knew that he went to the cross and suffered an agonizing death. And they all rejoiced when they saw the risen Lord on that first Easter. Do you suppose that their message was anything less than crisp and accurate and convincing? How do you know that I'm not speculating? Because the record shows that thousands and tens of thousands converted. They left their former way of life behind. They heard the message of the apostles. They heard the message that they themselves had received from a master storyteller, a great teacher, one who convinced not simply with his intellect and with his heart, but also with the goodness of his life. Our Lord was someone worth listening to. And the apostles, by their exposure to him, by their nearness to him, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit given to them at Pentecost, found themselves quite convincing as preachers, always pointing people to the Lord, always inviting them to repentance and baptism, always eager to celebrate in their midst as priests, as bishops, the Holy Eucharist, passing on the faith in word and in sacrament, passing on the faith by their very lives. Because in spite of what our young people are taught today, the message of Jesus was not about making money. Each one of those apostles, save only for St. John and Judas, he's a separate case, they earned the martyr's palm. Some of them in horrible ways. But even on their way to martyrdom, they traveled great distances amidst all sorts of impoverished circumstances. St. Thomas, the skeptic, brought the gospel all the way to India. St. Peter, the one who denied our Lord three times, made his way to Antioch and later to Rome, where he was the first bishop of Rome. And he gave his life for the Lord in the circus of Nero. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The preaching of the apostles recorded in sacred scripture. And we'll get to the dating of the Gospels next week. We'll get to the discussion of when each of the four Gospels was written. But we're going to find that it is not at all implausible to believe that the Apostles and the others, remember two of the evangelists were Apostles, Matthew and John, two, the other two had never met Jesus, Mark and Luke, it is altogether plausible that what was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was an accurate recitation of the life of our Lord, His miracles, and His sayings. And that they did so in a way that was coherent and convincing. And these scriptures are in our possession today. We have the Gospels today. Not simply the version that you pulled off the shelf at the bookstore, but we can go back and we can find written texts that go back to the 4th and the 3rd and even the 2nd century, the 2nd century, the 100s, we can find an accuracy of transmission. Remember, there were no photocopy machines. Everything had to be done by hand, by scribes, 
who wrote accurately and transmitted one volume of the, of the scriptures at a time to various places around the world. And when we collect those today and compare them, it's very clear that there was an emphasis upon accuracy and, and c conservation of the message. We will discuss more next time about the Gospels. The, Dr. Petrie makes some very, very important observations about the Gospels, that they were not written anonymously, but we know who wrote the Gospels. We know that two were apostles and that two others were close associates of St. Peter and St. Paul. We know that these Gospels, the four Gospels, come to us with titles on them, that we know those titles go back to the earliest centuries. These were not much later editions. This was the equivalent of what every student learns, that you have to put your name at the top of the page, that, that these were signed and these were presented with personal authority. And we also have the testimony of the fathers of the church. The fathers of the church refer to saints and other writers who lived as the apostles were starting to die out. They lived at a time when it was their responsibility to pass on the faith. And we refer to the fathers of the church as those who wrote more or less from the end of the first century until about the seventh or eighth century. Their writings are extant and have been translated for you to read. Wheaton College in Illinois, an evangelical college, has collected the writings of the fathers of the church in English translation and made them available online for anyone who goes into the CCEL, the Christian Classic Ethereal Library. When I was in seminary, all of those writings took up an entire wall in the library. I do not exaggerate. From, from that wall to that wall were bookshelves. And if you wanted to read, you had to climb a ladder and, and cheat death to pull out a volume and, and, and open it up to read it. In the original Latin or the original Greek, there were translations, but hither, hither and yon, Wheaton College has put all of them together in such a way that you can go and you can search and you can read. And you can see that the testimony of the fathers of the church conserves the teachings of the apostles and the teachings of our Lord. Why is this so? As one example, St. Ignatius of Antioch the Bishop of Antioch, he was one of the successors of St. Peter as Bishop of Antioch. St. Peter was the Bishop of Antioch before going to Rome to be the Bishop of Rome. St. Ignatius of Antioch, tremendous saint, one of my favorites. He was arrested by the Romans precisely because he was the Bishop of the Christians in Antioch. He was sent to Rome for execution. Antioch is in modern day Turkey. Took a long time to get from Turkey to Rome. On his way, Ignatius wrote letters that you can read. In one of them, he writes to the Romans, the, the Christians in Rome, begging them not to do anything that would interfere with his being executed in Rome. 
he wanted to give the testimony in his blood. Then, as in now, it's always possible to bribe an official and have them leave the gate open, the cell open, would have been possible. There were wealthy Christians in Rome. They could have done it. Ignatius begged them not to do that. He said, I am like the wheat of God, and let the wheat of God be ground by the teeth of the lions, so that the flower produced would become the bread of the Holy Eucharist. Where did St. Ignatius of Antioch get all of this? Where did he get his wisdom? He lived around the turn of the first and second centuries. St. Ignatius of Antioch learned his faith from St. Polycarp of Smyrna. You know that your parents love you when your name is Polycarp of Smyrna. <laughs> St. Polycarp of Smyrna wrote a great deal. He is one of the fathers of the church. His writings are extant for you to read. St. Polycarp of Smyrna taught St. Ignatius of Antioch. And he also taught St. Irenaeus. St. Irenaeus was one of the writers who produced some very beautiful documents, some very beautiful lessons about the Blessed Mother, speaking of the Blessed Mother as the new Eve, as Christ is the new Adam, she is the new Eve, and the knot, think of a knot, a, a, a knot ropes knotted up, the knot of Eve's disobedience was undone by the obedience of the Blessed Mother saying, be it done unto me according to thy will. This is where we get the phrase, Mary, undoer of knots. St. Ignatius learned from Polycarp. St. Irenaeus learned from Polycarp. Where did Polycarp learn his faith? St. John the Apostle. The beloved Apostle the one who was with the Lord all the way to the cross, the one who knew the Blessed Mother well, St. John the Apostle, who had heard our Lord speak for three years, who had heard the Lord recite the parables time and time again, who could testify to his miracles, who could testify to his being crucified, laid in the tomb, and then raised on the third day. St. John the Apostle taught St. Polycarp of Smyrna, who taught two other important fathers of the church who have influenced two millennia of Christians. When we look at the catechism of the Catholic Church, when we look at the teachings of the church, and we compare what the church teaches today with what St. Polycarp and St. Ignatius and St. Irenaeus have written, and we can read their writings, we can see that there is tremendous consistency. Tremendous consistency between what we believe today and what the earliest Christians on record believed, those who had been taught by the apostles themselves. This gives us evidence, doesn't it? This gives us evidence of the content of our faith being reliable. This gives us evidence that oral tradition, when it is important and when it is repeated often enough in a way that is memorable and heard by those who are capable of, of remembering is just as reliable, if not more reliable, than the written word. 
the written word. Who has a match? <laughs> the written word. Books in libraries have been known to disintegrate because of the way in which the paper was made and kept in, together on a shelf for 50 years, it turns to dust. In this digital age, when you look something up online and you look for a saying, is there any guarantee at all of authenticity? But the griot in Africa <laughs> can go back hundreds of years reciting the same thing over and over and over again. Fortunately, we do not have to have that capacity today. We have enough copies of the scripture and we have enough knowledge to know that what we read in our Bibles, especially if you are like Dr. Petrie, who can read the scriptures in the original Greek and the original Hebrew, we can see that what we have is indeed what has been passed on through divine revelation, passed on by the writings of the fathers of the church and passed on in their legacy and testimony signed in blood. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Next time, we'll talk about the dating of the Gospels and we'll talk also about this character named Josephus and how he has some interesting things to teach us about the life of Christ. I'm going to open it up for questions or observations or... Yes? Yep. What, what I'd like to know is what was the uh, what was the genesis of that trend in seminaries to take that idea, to take that philosophy Yeah, very, very good question. It had to do with the fact that, that Dr. Petrie talks about the anonymous gospels and things that he learned early on in his theological formation. And I'll tell you that I learned a lot of that same that same thing. Uh, that uh, Oh, the Gospel of, of Matthew was, was probably not written by Matthew, the tax collector, but there was a community of people that, uh, that kind of knew the teaching of St. Matthew, and that community of people kind of put it all together. I was being taught. Have you ever, have, have you ever seen something written by a committee? <laughs> We have a lot of inspiring works of literature written by committees, don't we? What brought that all about, the question was, what's the origin of that? The, the doubting of the, about the dates of the scriptures, saying that they were written long after, and also that they were not written by the, by the, the four named gospel writers. It goes back to the late 1800s. It goes back to some trends in German scholarship known as the historical critical method, which was the method of studying scripture when I was a student in the seminary, but it was not the only method of studying scripture. In fact, uh, Pope Benedict, even before he became Pope, was a scholar of great prominence. And he wrote, he said, the, the historical critical method has its merits, but it cannot be used alone to get the meaning of the scriptures. And so he would, he would challenge the assumptions of the historical critical method based upon the testimony of the fathers of the church. But it's, uh, it, was, it was very popular, and I will tell you that it's quite insidious. Many people will teach scripture by just standing and, and saying just, just very bluntly, we really don't know who wrote the Gospel of St. Mark. We really don't know, you know who, wrote, who wrote St. John's Gospel. We really don't know. Uh, that goes directly against 
the teachings of the early fathers of the church, some of whom knew St. John the Apostle. And they knew, and St. John was the, was the apostle who lived the longest. He was a young man when he followed the Lord. He lived until his old age. He died of natural causes, the only apostle to die of natural causes. So we're discrediting the fathers of the church when going down that line, and we're discrediting the apostles themselves. But it's, it's, it's all over the place, and you'll find some of these things even in the preface to our Bibles and the preface to the different, chapter, different books of the Bible. Other questions or comments? Any insights from our study? Okay, if you want to learn more about this, go to formed.org. Get signed up for free by pulling down the Dearborn County Catholic tab. If you have questions, ask me next time. Maybe we can do a little demonstration next time. Uh, and you can listen to Dr. Petrie explain uh, what he has presented, and it might, might be just a way of going deeper. I encourage your further study, and um, I hope that you uh, find your way back here next time and tell your friends too and there'll be plenty of plenty of room plenty of extra chairs okay so we will close tonight in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit Amen. heavenly father we are thankful and grateful for this opportunity to be together we are thankful for your revelation and the very credible way in which your word has been brought to us through the testimony of the apostles and the writer, writings of the evangelists. We ask that you help us to live out the faith that comes to us from the apostles through our participation in the sacramental life of the church. And we ask the intercession of the Blessed Mother, the bearer of God's word, the bearer of of God's truth, the one who brought into our world the bread of life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. We ask the Blessed Mother's intercession as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming out tonight. Amen.